Hello. So yes, so I'm Sally. I'm an iOS developer and accessibility consultant, and I'm based in London. So I'm a little bit jet lagged at the moment. Um, I'm usually going to bed right about now, but I've had some coffee, so I think I'll be okay. I'm really passionate about accessibility because there's been a lot of people very close to me who it's affected. So my dad has severe vision problems, my mom had ALS and lost most of her motor skills, and my brother is very dyslexic. So I've seen firsthand how much of an impact making things accessible can have. And the title of this talk is Implementing Inclusive Interfaces in iOS. Before getting into the implementation details, I want to start off by explaining what inclusive means. Oftentimes, we use inclusive and accessible interchangeably. But with accessible, there's more emphasis on making something specifically for someone who's disabled. And then in apps, we tend to assume accessible means something like voiceover. And disability can be a very isolating word. If you think of making something accessible just as uh, something for people with disabilities, then you're missing out on a large number of users. And don't dismiss people if, if they have something like voiceover turned on. They still might want to take photos. They still might drive a car. The reason why they use voiceover might vary quite greatly. And when we talk about something that's inclusive, we mean everyone. We want people to feel part of something. We want people to feel part of something much greater than just a small subset. It's a much warmer and fuzzier word. And the other part that we need to clarify is interfaces. Sorry, I've just realized that none of my si ah, cool. slides. <laughs> uh, the other part that we need to clarify is interfaces. Uh, so what's an interface? Simply. It's what enables us to communicate with a computer. And as developers, when we think about interfaces, we tend to think about a graphical user interface. But interfaces can present in lots of different ways. So they might be audio-based, they might be tactile, they might be haptic. And these kinds of interfaces are what enables most people to use devices. And Apple provides a number of ways for people with varying levels of ability to interact with their devices. So I'm going to start off by going through what they have for people with vision impairments. So these are all the different things that you have access to uh, as a user on iOS devices. The ones that are highlighted in yellow, we actually have direct API access. So you can support them in your app with only a few lines of code. Apple have made this incredible screen reading technology called VoiceOver. And VoiceOver replicates what's on the screen by speaking it. And it speaks more than 30 languages. So if your app is already localized, it can also be localized for VoiceOver. It's available on iOS, OS X, Apple TV, and now the Apple Watch. For people who maybe have hearing difficulties as well, they can extend VoiceOver to use it with Braille. And when most people think of Braille, they think of paper. But it's not this kind of Braille. It's this kind of Braille. So this is one cell of a refreshable Braille display. So it's like live Braille. And the output of VoiceOver gets fed into basically a row of refreshable Braille cells. So this is what a Braille keyboard looks like. And you can see the bottom row, that's where all the cells are. And the buttons on the top are a way of like, faster input for them. And it's really amazing that they've taken a device that would be completely unusable, and they've made it totally accessible. And although I've grouped VoiceOver in with vision, I do want to remind you that it's not just for people who have vision impairments. It might be for people who have difficulty focusing on a screen. So I'm going to do a quick demo of how to use VoiceOver. Is the screen? Yay, the screen has appeared. So to turn VoiceOver on, I'm going to go into Settings, and then into General, Accessibility. And then I can turn VoiceOver on. 
Can you hear anything coming out? Uh, so voiceover basically uh, it highlights the currently selected element and speaks out what the value is. Voiceover. Heading. Ah. Accessibility. Back button. Voiceover. Heading. Yay. Audio. Voiceover. Ah. So you can navigate kind of two ways. You can either tap directly on an item to highlight it, or you can swipe. Voiceover speaks items on the screen. Tap once to double tap to act. Swipe briefly. Voiceover practice. Button. So let's do something a little bit more settings. exciting than looking at the settings of VoiceOver. Uh, Camera. So maybe you want to take a picture. So to activate an item, you have to double tap. Camera. Flash. So let's Off. see. I don't think it can see any of you because the lights are too bright. Uh, One face. Zero faces. It. HDR. Timer. Camera chooser. Back facing. Using front facing switch camera. To camera chooser. Front facing. Mm. Then. Camera really chooser. Bright. One face. Large face. Face near top edge. So it's very cool because it actually finds the face one and face. gives the user feedback. So if I zero, one face, not zero faces. kind of says where I am on the screen. And then ah. one face, large face, take picture, button. Take picture. I can zip, take a face, picture. Not, zip, photo and video viewer. Button. Photo and video viewer. Then. And then I can actually photos, view it. Button. Today, done. 40, 17, and it will give me a photo, description. Portrait, 40, 17, one face, crisp, very dark, image. Of what's in the picture. So that's quite cool. So if I then wanted to maybe play my favorite game, Settings. Flappy Bird. Camera. Flappy Bird. Let's see how this. Okay. Flappy Bird. Welcome back. Most good. So that's found me, but unfortunately, there's nothing in Flappy Bird that's accessible, so I can't play it. But that's a quick introduction in how to get around Settings. using VoiceOver. I'm just going to turn VoiceOver off and switch back to the slides. OK. Now, there's also people who have impairments with physical and motor skills, and it can vary greatly between people, person to person. Some of them might not be able to perform a gesture, some of them might not be able to press physical buttons or even hold an iPhone. And this can vary from anything to arthritis to somebody being fully physically paralyzed. And Apple provides two ways for people with physical and motor impairments to access iOS devices. The first one is assistive touch. And this is really great for people who have difficulties pressing hardware buttons or performing gestures. So all they have to do is actually tap which gesture that they want performed. And if you had an iPhone 4 or 4S and your home button stopped working, you might have actually used this to actually use your home button again. The switch control is the second one, and it's still relatively unknown by developers. But this was one of the best new features in iOS 7. And it allows users to navigate items sequentially uh, using just an external switch. And you can perform actions using a variety of switches. So it could be a physical Bluetooth connected switch. It could also just be a camera. So it detects left and right head movement. Um, but you could also use the screen as a switch. So this is an example of a switch. Uh, they could be activated with feet, hands, your head, all sorts of things. And you can, have, you can actually set up multiple switches so you can have finer control over the experience. So I'm going to do a quick demo of how to use which control. And I've set up, you can actually use an Apple wireless keyboard as a switch. So I've set up, I've connected uh, the keyboard already. So if I go into accessibility and switch controls down in interaction. So before you turn it on, it's important to add some switches. So I've added one switch, the space bar, which performs a tap, and the command key, which activates the home button. So I'm going to turn that on. And as you can see, it has the red outline, and, and this just cycles through everything on the screen. So I'm going to go home. And now if I wanted to take 
a photo. Actually, yeah, not enough hands. Okay. Oh, no, not Flappy Bird. <laughs> okay. Let's try that again. Ah. Okay, let's try the photo again. So now, it's the same problem, we can't see anything. But I can take a photo just using the space bar on the keyboard. And if I wanted to change maybe the filter that it's using, I can just wait for it to go over there. And then maybe I'll change it to instant. So it's very cool, it makes it totally usable. Now, let's have another go at Flappy Bird. So Flappy Bird seems like it would be a perfect game for something like Switch Control, because all you have to do is tap. As we saw before, there was nothing that was accessible in it, so what you get is this scanner, which I like to call Cylon Mode, because it kind of reminds me of Cylon. Uh, but basically, you just tap when you want it to kind of select the area, and you can fine tune basically what you want selected. Okay, let's see. Let's see how far I can get. Ah, <laughs> it's not recognizing it. Let's see, okay, ah, not very far. <laughs> but it's a shame, because it would be a game that would be super easy to actually make accessible. Cool. So, let me switch back over to the size. Okay, so Apple also provides some ways for people with learning difficulties to use iOS. And this is called guided access. iOS can be very overwhelming and distracting. Uh, there's so many apps and so many notifications and things going on trying to get your attention. And it basically enables people who have autism or other sorts of sensory challenges uh, to stay focused on a specific task. Parents or teachers can limit the area on the device that they can use, as well as how much time they can spend. They can disable things like the home button so that the person has to stay in the app. For users with hearing impairments, Apple have provided things like, there's a very cool, they're very cool uh, made for iPhone hearing aids. So you can actually control your hearing aid with your phone. There's the LED flash, uh, which quite a few people have actually turned on. There's mono audio, noise cancellation, audio balance, and subtitles and captioning. So the last part of the title to go through is the, implement, the implementation part. So I'm gonna first cover the basics of the accessibility APIs on iOS. The number one thing to do is to actually say, this thing is an accessibility element. And by default, if you're using UIKit, this should be set to yes. Uh, in a few instances, you might need to, to manually change it to yes, but for the most part, you should be fine. There are also instances where you turn it to no, because maybe you don't want VoiceOver to actually read it. It might be redundant information. And the next thing is the accessibility label. So the label is what identifies the element to the user. And by default, again, in UIKit, it uses the title of the control. So if you have a button that's named, it will use the title from the button. But be very careful, because if you use an image for the button and it has no title, it will actually read out the file name of the image, <laughs> which is not very nice. But you don't need to actually include the control type, so you don't need to say it's a button. You just need to say, like, play or something like that. So the next thing is the accessibility hint, and this describes the outcome of performing that action. Don't make it sound like a command, it should be something a little nicer, like it sends a message. Um, always start with a verb describing the result, and keep it brief. But don't rely on it, so users can turn this off, so don't make it so that they actually have to hear the hint to be able to understand what the element does. So accessibility traits, uh, basically characterize what the element does. And for UIKit controls, most things have quite a few traits by default. You can also combine traits if you want. Um, it's very easy to do. You just put an OR operator in, 
you can also, if you've subclassed something, you can access the superclasses accessibility traits. This is a list of all the different traits that you get. Uh, most of these are available kind of iOS 6 and onwards. If you need to do anything before iOS 6, I think about half the list <laughs> isn't so usable. And the last thing is accessibility value. So if you have something like a slider on the screen, you know, graphically you can look at this and you can go, okay, I know it's probably like medium-sized text. But if you imagine you can't see those A's, and the slider just says 50%, what is the 50% relative to? So it's important to use something like the accessibility value to give the user a little bit more feedback about it. So in this, in this case, you'd maybe say like 16 point font or medium. And if you use storyboards or zibs, it's really easy to fill these things out. All you have to do is open up the inspector and add everything in. So then the next part is actually testing and verifying the accessibility of your app. So in the iOS simulator, you have access to the accessibility inspector. And this shows you what the currently accessed control is and any notifications that might be coming in. You can access this by going into the settings app on the simulator, going into general accessibility and accessibility inspector. It's really great for debugging, but really to get the, the whole kind of experience, you need to use VoiceOver on a device. So there's a few ways of turning VoiceOver on. Probably the easiest way is just asking Siri to turn VoiceOver on, and it will also turn VoiceOver off. And once you've gotten really good at using VoiceOver, or if you want to kind of level up your testing, you can turn the screen curtain on. So you take three fingers and you triple tap on the screen and the whole screen will go dark, but you'll still be able to access everything. It's really good at conserving battery, <laughs> but you do have to have voiceover on. And when you turn voiceover off, it will automatically turn screen curtain on if you have it on. There's also the accessibility shortcut. So within the accessibility settings in general, you can, triple, you can set which things you want to pop up. So if you triple tap the home button, you can toggle between voiceover, switch control, I think you can do grayscale, gray uh, guided access, and a few other things. So if you want to test out switch control, the only way to do it is actually on a device. There's nothing in the simulator that gives you support for that. So we've seen the basics of how to label and enable elements for accessibility. And this gives us what I like to think of as an MVP for accessibility. This is, everyone can use it, but it's still probably a little rough around the edges. So there's lots of steps that we can take to improve the inclusive user experience. So the first thing I recommend to do is to print out the screenshots of the app. So I print them out quite big on a sheet of paper, and then I take some post-it notes, and I turn voiceover on, and I just go through and write on a post-it note what voiceover says, and I stick it on top of the element. And this gives you a really good idea of what things maybe need to be fixed. Um, so this is from the British Airways app. And I'm not sure if you can see on the nav bar, the little home button, voiceover reads that as math-free home button. So obviously, that's an image-based button and not a very good experience. So the other thing I really recommend doing is making a list of everything on a screen that voiceover reads. So this, you just kind of flick through in order and, and write everything out. So you can see in the middle, the one marked original, that's every single element on the screen that voiceover sees, which is a ridiculously long list. And you can see there's loads of stuff that just shouldn't really be there. So there's quite a few things that just say button and zero and one, but have no context. So on the, on the right side is the very simplified version. So that's everything that actually needs to be on that screen. It's more than half of the stuff that could get, you know, that could just go away. Uh, so it's always a good idea to just, to just do this. And the great thing about these two, the last one of the post-it notes and this one, is anybody on the team can do it. You don't have to do it as, like a developer doesn't have to sit and do it. A project manager can do it. A 
QA person can do it, or a designer could do it even. So, so once everything is labeled correctly, uh, your app will now be usable, but we know that a killer user experience is what makes the difference. So these are a few things that you can go to if you want to go the extra mile. So the first thing you can do is find out if voiceover is turned on. And this is great because you might want to slightly simplify the interface or present a different interface altogether. Um, equally, if you want to know how many people are using voiceover in your app, you could find this out and log it to analytics. You can also choose to move focus with voiceover. So if you're presenting something and you want it to focus on a particular element on that new view, you could just call, you could post a notification and pass it the element you want it to focus on. You can also tell it to ignore specific elements. So again, this is good if there's anything that might be redundant or just kind of confuses things. Direct interaction is really great if you have anything like a drawing app or maybe a piano, something where the user really needs to interact directly with the app. Um, so all you need to do is, is add the trait for direct interaction. And yet localization and voiceover, so you can just use a localized string and pass it the, the value. There's quite a few different accessibility notifications that you can use. So there's ones where you can post. Uh, there's also ones you can listen to. So like if, if the page scrolls, you might need to update your UI. You can also find out when voiceover finishes speaking. So this might be good if you're combining voiceover and sound effects. You don't want the sound effects to overlap with what voiceover is saying. There's also the magic tap. So this is quite easy to abuse. <laughs> but. Um, for a good example of how it's used is in the phone app. So if you're on a phone call, if you do a two-finger double tap, it will actually end the current phone call. So this is just like a shortcut gesture to do something that would be really convenient in that situation. And you can enable this on pretty much, you can enable it to do different things on pretty much any view in your app, <laughs> but that would be a bit uh, not useful. So probably try to only do maybe three in an app uh, if you just want one thing to happen in your entire app for Magic Tap, then you can just implement this in uh, the app delegate. So in, in iOS 7, we got that really nice slide to get back when you kind of slide from the edge of the screen. And this is the equivalent of how you do it in VoiceOver. So it's two fingers scrub back and forth. And if, you have, if you've presented any sort of view like in a custom way, and there's, it's not really properly like pushed onto the nav stack, then this is a good way to dismiss your view in any kind of other way. And equally, if you've presented something modally, it's important to tell VoiceOver that this accessibility view is modal. And this will basically make, make it so that anything that's below it won't be able to be interacted with. So brand new in iOS 8 was the ability to actually find out if switch control is on, which is very cool. So you can do things like, again, simplify your interface. Or maybe if you have a game, you might want to slightly change the controls or maybe slow the game down a little bit. You can also pause and resume. So uh, if maybe your app has a really long animation in it and you don't want switch control to kind of keep toggling through things, uh, you can pause the assistive technology and then resume it once the notification is finished, once the animation's finished. Uh, you can also add custom support for guided access. So if you know your app is going to be used specifically by people who have autism, then it might be good to go the extra mile and add support for this. So I have a few things for you to do. Number one. Spend a whole day with voiceover or switch control on your phone. And this will give you a really good idea of what people struggle with. When you test things out like voiceover and switch control, you're bound to feel frustrated. But I want you to feel frustrated. This is the good kind of frustration. It will help you build empathy with these users who rely on these technologies. Number two, don't make assumptions. Users vary. One person who's blind is totally different from another person who's blind. 
one person who uses voiceover is also completely different from another person who uses voiceover. So don't just assume that somebody can't take a photo or do something like that. In a, in a similar way, like if somebody has closed captioning on, it doesn't mean that they're deaf. It might just mean that it's not their first language. Number three, the first place to start is by labeling and enabling all elements. This creates your inclusive MVP. Then you can focus on iterating and polishing. So if it seems like too much, just do a little bit every week or maybe even just every month. Once you have your inclusive app, make sure you keep it going. Requirements are something that all features need to adhere to, but features can be moved to the backlog. Make it a requirement instead of a feature. There's a few resources. So there's a guide that Apple's made on testing accessibility for iOS. There's some sample code if you're using something that's not standard UI kit, which is quite good. It's a little draggy, droppy game. Uh, there's also the accessibility programming guide for iOS. And there's a really good website that helps you kind of visualize different uh, vision impairments. I've recently started a project on Kickstarter called the Inclusive Toolkit, which automates some of the testing stuff that I talked about before, like visualizing different parts of voiceover. Um, if you'd like more information about it, you can check it out at bit.ly slash inclusive tools. I have stickers. Come and find me if you'd like some stickers. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, you can tweet at me or come find me. And feedback is very important, so you can send any feedback to T08 at or two three nine two four two. Well, thank you.